Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter, and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where you are and what time it is where you guys are tuning in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got brothers and sisters from around the world joining us uh, 227 days in a row. We've shown up, shown out, uh, just kind of resetting the room, giving you guys an idea of what we do and what we've been doing is we will read uh, one chapter from the New Testament and one chapter from the Old Testament. And we have done this for 227 days. We've worked our way all the way to the final chapter of James, where uh, we're going to do a digital altar call here at the very end. Um, it's been a, a beautiful journey, you guys, to say the least. Hundreds of people have been saved uh, right here in this Jeep or whether we're on the road, wherever we've gone, we have not missed. 227 days in a row has been uh, absolutely amazing. We've had a couple hiccups. We've had to go to YouTube Live once when Instagram wasn't working. And just the other day, I was late for the very first time on day 225. I overslept. I woke up, went back to sleep with my phone on my chest after I turned off the alarm, and uh, but still showed up about eight minutes later. So it's been a beautiful journey. We have brothers and sisters from around the world. As I'm reading, people are from India. Uh, people are coming in from Texas. People are coming in from Mariposa, California, Kansas City. We've got Vallejo, California, Long Island, New York. I love to see it. Ohio, Brisbane, Australia, Dallas, Georgia, not even Texas. We got the Bronx in the house. Boston, right? I feel like I said that with an accent. Boston, Boston. Why did I do that? I have no idea. Uh, it's not what I meant to do, but I said it how I said it. Ontario, Canada, Costa Rica. That's where I'm going to stop right there. So we are going to finish up James chapter five and we are in uh, Genesis chapter 29. I'm honored. You guys, thankful, grateful, absolutely honored to be a part of this on a daily basis, to be a part of your day. If you're watching the replay, I love you. We appreciate you guys taking time later if you can't make it. And if you're on the podcast, um, we just honor you guys for running that up. Over 300 active users and listeners right now on the podcast, which is um, a thing of beauty. And by the way, if you're on the podcast, I'm the guy who uploads it. So sometimes like Sometimes I don't do it till later. Sometimes I don't do it till the next day because sometimes I forget. So please be patient. Remind, just remember that, um, you know, I'm just a guy. I make a lot of mistakes. So um, the podcast is called Coffee and Prayer as well. It's the It's literally this recorded and then uploaded so that people who don't have social media can listen to it. Or if you don't like the comments, um, you can always just listen to the podcast. So it takes my face out of it as well. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, beautiful. So let's pray and uh, let's jump right into James. I got a lot I want to share. And um, we've got a digital altar call to, uh, to do today. We got people, we got souls to get saved. Amen. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. Lord, have your way with us. God, as we embark on this brand new week, uh, we just lay everything down at the foot of your throne. We There, there are emails coming in. There's so many to-do lists. There's all kinds of stuff that's popping up. God, we just, we surrender it all. Lord, we want to, we don't want to do it. We don't want to run through it unless it's coming from you. We understand that you've gone before us and you've created good works for us to complete. And so we surrender our own will. We surrender our own plans and purpose. And we ask that you would lead us. Take us by the hand, Lord. We are surrendering right now. We are submitting right now. We're asking that you would, again, have your way with us. We, we don't want it if it's not from you. So as we enter into this place, again, we're setting aside all distractions, things that are pulling at our focus and attention. And um, we're, Lord, we're just asking that you would teach us, that you would change us, that you would transform us, that you would help us to have a deeper and better understanding of your word, of who you are, and who you say that we are. God, we need you. And uh, we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Man, uh, so so James chapter five kind of rolls in from the previous chapter, talking about you know in the previous chapter, let God plan your life. You don't know what you know what tomorrow will hold. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Your life is like a mist. It immediately rolls in and says, "Hey, look, you rich people, listen, cry and be very sad because of the troubles that are coming to you." 
Your riches have rotted and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver have rusted and the rust will be a proof that you were wrong. He goes in and says, um, the pay you did not give the workers who mowed your fields cry out against you. Verse five says, your life on earth was full of rich living and pleasing yourselves with everything you wanted. You made yourselves fat like an animal ready to be killed. You have judged guilty and then murdered innocent people who were not even against you. Uh, let's put this into context. Understand that James here is talking to the rich people in the community. Uh, again, uh, James is a pastor and is running a church there in Jerusalem. And understand that the, Jew, the, the, the Jewish Christians experienced some extremely harsh persecution, being that Jerusalem was a hub for Judaism, right? It was a, it was a main hub. So imagine... Uh, Jewish individuals who were defecting from Judaism and becoming followers of Jesus, they had a hard time letting go of their man-made tradition, but they also had resistance from the local community. And in this local community, uh, not only would they stone them and beat them and execute them and persecute, they would do all of these things, but they would also withhold goods and services. It was almost as if they were taking a scarlet letter on themselves saying that, hey, we're, we're walking away from Judaism, which is our people's religion is what our forefathers have followed forever and now we're following this Jesus who many believed was a false prophet believed that he was not the Messiah that he was a crazy man and so here these individuals who are leaving the ways of Judaism and following Christ uh, they were pushed to the outskirts of town and the, the church there in Jerusalem was extremely persecuted. And so here in the community, he's talking to the rich oppressors, the individuals in that place. They were withholding wages. They were treating them poorly. They were making judgments and calling individuals into court and having them executed. Uh, the things that were going on right there, they were, um, they were being manipulative and they, were, they, they weren't being good to the church in that place. And so this is a call to the leaders in the community, those who were rich saying, hey, the day of judgment is upon you. It's going to come. You're sitting here fattening yourselves like a, a, a cow being head, led to the slaughter, right? You're being, you're overfeeding yourself. Your hope, your trust, your faith is in your riches and your materials and your things. It's not in relationship. You don't care about people. You don't love people. Your life here on this earth is filled with just uh, rich living and pleasing yourselves with everything that you wanted. And there's going to be a day that you have to answer for that. Now, although that's context, what can we take from that? That's very applicable to today. So we put it in context, yet we pull it out and say, what can we take from this? Being rich isn't a sin. Having money isn't a sin. Having nice things is not a sin. I think that that needs to be talked about. Um, there is this form of poverty gospel that's out there that would make you feel bad for succeeding. I believe that there are kingdom millionaires. There are kingdom billionaires. There are individuals who are good stewards of money and finances in the kingdom of God. And that is their gifting because they are responsible, because they don't love their money, because they don't idolize it, because they generate it and then, you know, they, they give it away and they help others. Others, God blesses those individuals because they are cornerstones where there, there's money is needed. Churches aren't free, right? As much as we don't like to talk about money and as much as we like to demonize it or we try to demonize those who have it, it's a very real necessity, right? If you want to feed people overseas and you want to make an impact in the homelessness, if you want to help others, many times it requires money. It requires tithing and it requires people giving, donating, contributing. It requires your time, your energy energy, your effort. There is a cost to those things. And so um, as, as much as we like to demonize those who have things, there are individuals who are positioned with more than enough because they are good stewards. And you wonder why, well, man, uh, you know, why can't I be one of those people? Uh, I would probably make an assumption that maybe because you're not even faithful with the little bit that you have. Right. And this is this is a broad assumption and this might not be you. But what I see many times is people are praying, God, God, let you know, bless me, you know, open the storehouses, you know, give me bless me financially. You know, I, I want all of this money yet the little bit that they do have, they're not even faithful with it. They don't contribute. They hold on to it. They hoard it because they have this scarcity mentality because they don't think that there's enough or more that's going to come in. They stop the flow of giving. Many times God blesses individuals so that they can be a blessing. But even when we're blessed with a little, rather than using that to be a blessing, we'll go out and we'll buy uh, an expensive belt or, or a, a, a fancy shirt 
or a bag or we'll take a trip or we'll throw some rims on our minivan or we'll put a new system and some speakers in the back, right? We get these tax returns, we get these stimulus checks and we go get the newest, latest model of uh, the 70 inch TV from Walmart, right? If we, our, 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 It's because we're not being good stewards and faithful with what we've got. And then we wonder why God isn't increasing uh, what we have is because we're not being good stewards in the first place. And that's not the case for everybody. That's just things that I see where individuals are praying, God, give me more, more, more. But the, he understands your heart. Your heart and your intention are in the wrong place. He knows that if he gives you more, it's going to stop right there. And many times as he increases your storehouse, you're probably going to use it for your own selfish ambitions. And we can scream from the rooftops, not me, that wouldn't be me. It's easy to say that when we don't have it. But the beauty of it is that God sees your heart. Many times God sees things in your heart that you don't even see. Now that deserves an amen. God sees things in your heart that many times you're blinded by, right? Many times God know. I mean, all the time God knows what's in your heart. And many times we don't even see it. We don't see the sty in our eye. We don't see the little darkness that's taking place in there. We can lie, manipulate, trick ourselves. We can make excuses and, you know, use all of these, you know, pretend scenarios of, well, if this happened, then this is what I would do. And this is what I would do. But God knows your heart. And there's a reason behind the fact that you don't, uh, you're not in that position. So I, I said that to say this. Riches aren't evil. The love of money absolutely is. When it becomes your idol, when it becomes first, when you elevate it, when that's what your life becomes about, then absolutely. But here it is still a warning. Hey, your life here on this earth was full of rich living and pleasing yourselves with everything that you wanted. I many times thank God and say, you know what, Lord? I'm grateful that I have what I have and I'm thankful for what I've got because I know that you are my provider. You make sure that I have everything. Do I live in lavishness and, and abundance? Absolutely not, but I'm taken care of. I don't miss a meal. I've got gas in my car, even though it costs almost $7 a gallon. I've got a roof over my head, right? I, I don't want for anything. I don't need anything. Of course, I want for things. There's things that I want, of course, but I don't need anything. God takes care of me. And I, I oftentimes wonder, is he doing that to protect me? Do I not have this abundance because he understands my heart? Maybe there's still, still some things that I need to work on and things that I need to develop before that happens, if that ever happens, right? It's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something to think about. It's something to, to talk about. But do understand this. He's not just yelling at everybody who's rich, this this. This is often taken outside of context and used to create this poverty gospel where God wants everybody. No, uh, he doesn't want everybody poor. There are individuals who we actually need who are in the kingdom, who are great stewards of finances, and they're able to bless the kingdom and the ministries and the individuals who are in need. It's a beautiful thing. We move forward. So now that he's kind of addressed, hey, what's going on here with the rich? He also tells his brothers and sisters, hey, be patient until the Lord comes again. A farmer, I love this analogy, a farmer patiently waits for his valuable crop to grow from the earth and for it to receive the autumn and spring rains. Verse eight says, you too must be patient. Do not give up hope. It says, uh, because the Lord is coming soon. Brothers and sisters, do not complain against each other or you will be judged guilty and the judge is ready to come. Let's go back for a second. He talks about being patient, right? Um, Patience is something that a lot of us struggle with. We say that we trust God, we have faith, yet uh, we can't even wait, you know, 10 days for something to come to pass. We get so impatient, we get so frustrated. But the analogy of planting a seed is, um, is a beautiful analogy. Let's just say you wanted to plant an apple tree. You can go out, dig a hole, plant the seed, you can cover it up, water it. How long until you actually start to bear fruit? from that tree where apples start to grow and you're actually able to eat them. See, I'm, I'm not into farming and I really don't know, but I can probably bet that it's going to take at least a full cycle, a full year of it being planted, cultivated, making sure that it's watered, making sure that weeds don't, you know, come up and, 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 and strangle out the seed, making sure that, you know, small animals don't come around and eat it once it starts to grow. Like, I, I don't know the full cycle of how long it is between you plant an apple tree and you actually start to eat apples. I have no idea, but I know that it's not immediate. I know that it doesn't happen immediately. Some people are saying that it takes years. 
that it takes years. Avocado trees take forever. My farmers, my people out there who till the ground, my people out there who, 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 do, uh, who do farming and planting, and those of you who have a green thumb, we understand this idea that you can plant a seed and it can take months, years, even decades before the, the seed that you planted actually bears fruit. Why is it that when we plant a prayer seed, we immediately think that it's going to sprout or there's honestly, there's immediately going to be fruit? Where is our patience, right? So, so for me, I feel like the prayers that I prayed three years ago are now starting to come to fruition. And so if I start to think with that, like, okay, wow, I, there's things that I have. I don't have it with me, but I have a journal that I was writing in in 2020. And there's things that I was writing down and I was praying. I was standing on Habakkuk 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, where you write things down on a tablet and make it plain and um, God will make those things happen. There were seeds that I planted in 2020 that I'm just now seeing the fruit of. I'm watching and witnessing those things. I'm walking in what I prayed for over two years ago. So with that mentality, as I'm like, oh, wow. So the things that I prayed for, the seeds and the prayers that I planted two years ago are now coming to fruition. Man, I better get started with planting seeds and praying now. If I reap the harvest of what I plant now and it comes later, then you know what I need to be busy doing right now? Right now, I need to be busy planting seed. I need to be praying. I need to be in my word. I need to be loving and helping people. The seeds that I'm planting today are going to come to fruition in my tomorrow. So you know what I want to be busy doing? Being patient and planting seed. Being patient and planting seed. Being patient and planting seed. That is what I need to be doing. Do we understand how that works? Being patient, planting seed, watering. Being patient, planting seed, watering. You know what else I need to do? Being patient, planting seed, watering, and shining light on those seeds. Being a light in this dark world. We think of the process of what it takes, right? In order for most seeds to grow, you need water. You need you know, uh, a ground that is ready, is cultivated, and is able to grow from. And you need sunlight. You need light. Well, Jesus is the light. Right. Many times our actions and how we tend to the seed that we planted is up to us. God waters the seed. We can water the seed. Other people can water the seed, but it's up to us to plant. You guys get that? So I want to be busy rather than overthinking or questioning or like being like, where's my prayer? You know, I'm sitting here impatient, questioning, upset, frustrated. Why don't I spend that same time and energy saying, okay, God's good. He heard my prayer. He planted the seed. So I'm going to continue to plant seeds today. I'm going to water those seeds, right? I'm going to be patient and I'm going to be a light in this world. I'm going to shine light on all of these seeds. I'm going to be patient because I believe that God is faithful and the harvest is going to come and it's going to come when I least expect it. Or maybe you do expect it. But all I know is I trust the process. I trust the cycle. I trust the system in which it's being likened to right here. A farmer patiently waits for his valuable crop to grow from the earth and for it to receive the autumn and spring rains. You too must be patient. Do not give up hope because the Lord is coming soon. I love that. Patience, planting, water, shine. Patience, planting, water, shine. Man, if we could do that every single day, I might not have it today, but you know what? It's coming. I might, it might not be here today, but you know what? It's coming. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to hold on to my hope. I'm going to trust God. I've planted the seeds. I'm going to continue to be patient. I'm going to continue to plant today. If, if what I plant today comes tomorrow, boy, am I going to be busy planting because I want the harvest to be great in my tomorrows. And that tomorrow is, I'm not even talking about, see, what we like to do is we like to think immediately about money. We think about material things. I want to be busy planting seed here while I'm on this earth because I believe the harvest that I'm going to reap is going to be great in eternity. I'm not only planting to receive while I'm here. It's not about just getting fat while I'm here on earth. It's not about just getting as much blessing while I can. You can't take it with you. You guys understand that? We can't take it with us. So, so our, our mindset of thinking, okay, well, we're going to plant, we're going to plant, we're going to plant, and we're going to water, 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 and we're hoping that in our tomorrows, the tomorrows that my eyes are fixed on is my eternity. That's the greater tomorrow. Do I want things while I'm here? Absolutely. I'm not going to sit here in front like I don't. Of course. But at the end of the day, I'm planting and watering and shining light while I'm here for my tomorrows, for eternity. 
Verse 10 says, brothers, and, oh wait, no, verse 9 says, uh, don't complain against each other or you're going to be judged guilty. Uh, verse 10 says, brothers and sisters, follow the examples of the prophets who spoke for the Lord. They suffered many hard things, but they were patient. They too were patient. Their hope wasn't in this world. They lived a life of suffering, right? We look at the prophets. We look at those who came before Jesus. We understand that the, they walked this life. They, they walked and they planted seeds. They were obedient. They were patient. They were loving. They were gentle. They were caring. They were kind. They planted seeds, but they suffered persecution because they weren't waiting for the harvest to be reaped here on this earth. They understood that they were planting for eternity. Does that make sense? They were planting for eternity. Many of the prophets ended, uh, their, their lives were ended by murder or persecution. They were hung. They were hung upside down. They were boiled alive. They were, they were beheaded, right? They were pulled limb from limb. I don't know about you, but that's not a dope harvest. Many of them were planting seeds. They were patient and their hope was in eternity. And I believe that as they step into eternity, they're going to reap the harvest of what they planted here on this earth. See, many of us have our minds fixed on today. We have our minds fixed on the physical realm. We're not focused on what we need to be focused on. So he says, look, follow the example of the prophets who spoke for the Lord. They suffered many hard things, but they were patient. We say that they are happy because they didn't give up. You've heard about Job's patience, right? Job not only was rewarded in eternity, but he was rewarded here on this earth. So many of us are thinking, okay, if I'm patient and I, I plant seeds and I'm prayerful and I do what I'm supposed to do, that I'm guaranteed to reap a harvest while I'm here on this earth. That's not the case. I don't know who and what and why. Like that's between you and God. I don't know what he has in store for you. But I know that there are many great individuals who planted, 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 you know, they sowed, they planted, they did all, they watered, they were a light, and then they went into eternity before ever receiving that harvest. And like we talked about yesterday and the day before, we'll even talk about it a little bit today. Um, the prayers of those who have come before us are being answered in our todays. You look at Abraham and the promise that God gave to Abraham. Not only did it uh, trickle down to his son Isaac, but also trickled down to his son Jacob. And, uh, you know, even, even Ishmael got some of the blessing from Abraham because of that. So the prayers and the seeds that Abraham planted and the faith that he had was, uh, was rolled forward, was counted forward to the generations to come. There's going to be seeds that you plant that you never see the harvest from, not until you go to eternity or maybe even in the generations after you. So the prayers that you're praying, the seeds that you're planting, the way that you're living, the faith that you have can be counted forward because right now you're planting and watering and sometimes those seeds might not come to fruition until you're long gone. But then we start talking about legacy. Is this all about me? I'm a very small piece of the puzzle. What if down your lineage, because of your faith, the next Billy Graham comes? I think about that often. Maybe the devil's attacking me and my life because he wants to stop me from planting the seed and, and that's going to sprout in 20, 30 years down the road. Maybe I'm long gone. Maybe it's my grandchild or my great grandchild who comes and starts to preach because of the faith that I have or the seeds that I planted. And it's from them that they start the next great revival. When we start to think outside of ourselves, this world is not about us. It's so much greater. We're a very small piece of the puzzle. Maybe it's my faith that's going to start and ignite the generations after me through my lineage that's going to spark revival that's going to change this nation. We don't know. We don't know. And maybe that's why the enemy's coming at you so hard to stop you and your faith and keep you from planting the very seeds that he knows is going to tear the kingdom of darkness apart. But see, we don't think like that. I want to plant seeds. I want to plant seeds that God blesses my bank account. I want to plant seeds and plant seeds so that God gives me a spouse. We're so short-sighted. We're so narrow-minded. And all that we can see is right here at the end of our noses. But that's not how God sees. My prayer is that we would start to look at life through the lens that God looks at it through. He looks at life on a different level, so much deeper, so much further. We're so concerned by our environment and our current circumstances that we typically don't see past what's going on around us. 
And so he's saying, hey, look, look at the example of the prophets. They spoke for the Lord. They suffered many hard things, but they were patient. See, the word of God is bringing us back to truth. The word of God is our true north. It's our compass. We get so distracted by the world and everything that's going on in it. And this is why it's so important for us to read our scripture daily, because what it's doing is it's it's washing our face and rubbing the stuff out of our eyes. We spend so much time in front of the screen and in front of entertainment, in front of social media and all of these things. It's just packed and caking on all of these layers over our eyes to where we can't see the truth. But when you get here in the truth, it starts to wipe those layers away and you start to see clear, gosh, man, life's not about me. It's all about Jesus. There's so much, there's such a greater thing going on right here, right? Life is about like, like I'm not promised uh, a life that's uh, filled with ease and comfort, man. So I'm planting seeds. I'm being patient. I might not reap the harvest of the seeds that I plant today, but I understand that those who come after me might reap the benefit. And I know that my promises aren't here in this world, but they're in eternity. Right? That is why it's important to be in this scripture because it's living, it's breathing, it's teaching, it's edifying, it's it's waking us up and bringing us back to where we're supposed to be, back to the center, and the center is Jesus. You know what I mean? Come on, somebody. It says we, you know, what we said that they're happy because they didn't give up. You heard about Job's patient patience, and you know the Lord's purpose for him in the end. You know the Lord is full of mercy and kindness. God is so good. Let's jump back. We'll go over here and uh, we'll jump forward. And um, it just talks about be careful what you say, right? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, you don't need to put it on your mama. You don't got to put it on God. Um, and, and this, what spoke to me on this, right? I'm going to take this out of context. So please, um, this isn't scriptural. I'm, I'm taking what spoke to me and... Uh, I want to be an individual who lives a life of integrity and I want my word to be so solid that when I say yes, it means yes. You understand what I mean? That's the legacy that I want to leave. So if somebody says something and I go, yes, that's where I want it to be. I don't want people to go, really? Oh, is it really? Put that on something, right? Put that on something. When people are asking you to put that on something that tells me that your word doesn't hold weight. Does that make sense? If somebody's like, swear to God, put that on something. That means that you might be a jokester. You might be a trickster. You might be sarcastic. You might not have a solid word, but I want to be at a place where if I say something, people understand, know that, Hey, I don't got to put it on my mama. I don't got to put it on God. I don't got to swear on nothing. My yes means yes. My no means no. Right. That's kind of what spoke to me. I'll leave it at that because that's not really based on scripture. That was my own personal, um, not, not interpretation, but that's what Holy Spirit spoke to me and what I kind of got out of that. Uh, <clears throat> moving forward, we talk about the power of prayer. There we go. Fred said it. Um, your, your word is bond. Right. And I'll be very clear. There's things, everything that I say on here, I, I don't have to, uh, you know, if, read the Bible. You're reading this on your own. This I'm reading and I'm doing these coffee and prayers for context, for truth, but also for personal experience and personal application. So every now and again, you guys, are, I'm going to be very clear. I'm not going to try to twist it or manipulate it. I'm going to share with you what God put on my heart. And that's absolutely okay. But I will always tell you, hey, take this with a grain of salt. He might not have spoke that to you. This is what he spoke to me. And that's okay. I don't have to everything that I say, oh, this is like, I'm a man. I'm a human being. So the power of prayer, right? Anyone who is having trouble should pray. Anyone who is happy should sing praises. Anyone who is sick should call the church's elders and they should pray for them and pour oil on that person in the name of the Lord. And the prayer that is said with faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will heal that person. And if the person has sinned, the sins will be forgiven. Verse 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so God can heal you. When a believing person prays, great things happen. So when you're faced with troubles, pray. When you're happy, praise. When you're sick, pray. Whenever, whatever you're going through, pray. You guys understand that? Whatever you're going through, pray. I do want to say this. Uh, I get a lot of people who will come to me and say, Andrew, well, you know, uh, we prayed for my grandfather who was sick with cancer and he still died. 
But the Bible says that if you pray for that person, that they're going to be healed. Um, I, I still believe in miracles and I've seen people miraculously healed. I know there's 500 people on here. Uh, a handful of you could probably attest to miracles that you've seen, healing miracles. But I do have to say this, not every single sickness is healed. Not every single sickness is healed. Um, Nobody gets out of here alive, right? Here we are again. Here I am talking about the dark side of life. Nobody gets out of here alive. Unfortunately, we don't get to pick, choose, uh, or, or debate how, when, or why we die. The, the sad reality is that people get sick and die. Kids get sick and die. People are lost every single day. And if it's time, it's time, right? The saying people say, um, oh, they were gone before their time. No, they weren't. That's that. No, they weren't. God didn't make a mistake. God takes who he wants when he wants. Understand that people are not our own. We become so sentimental and even we believe that, that we start to possess individuals. Well, that person was my person. That is my kid. That is my dad. No, first and foremost, that is God's creation. And he does with his creation as he pleases. We are, very, we are merely stewards of our kids. We are stewards of these things. We have been blessed with the time that we get to spend with these individuals and they go home when God says. So no, nobody's taken before their time because that would mean that our God made a mistake, but he does not. It's not easy. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's grievous. It's hard to accept, especially when we're looking at eyes, uh, at life through the eyes of, uh, of the physical realm. When we start to look at death for what it truly is, that we're passing from one place to the next, it's a graduation ceremony. We're leaving this physical, harsh world that's filled with evil and wickedness. And if you're saved and have a relationship with Jesus, then you get to step into eternity, into the presence of God. Then it's not a goodbye. It's a see you later. We start to understand that death isn't the end all say all. Death was defeated because of what Jesus Christ did. If anything, it gives me this sense of urgency on why I need to get get my friends and family members saved so that when God does call their number, whether I'm ready for it or not, it's not a goodbye. It's a see you later. So, so we get so mad at God and we get frustrated and we'll use scripture like this. Well, I prayed and he didn't, he didn't save them. He didn't look, everybody's got to die. There's 520 people on here and guess what? hundred percent, every one of them are going to die. Is that dark? No, that's real. And I don't think that a lot of people like, I don't think a lot of people come to grips with mortality. Uh, we don't get to choose. We don't get to pick. We don't, you know, we don't know. We're not necessarily forewarned. And in some cases we might be because somebody's sick and deteriorating. And so we might be able to prepare ourselves with anticipation, but even then we're not even prepared for them to breathe their last breath because we're, we're so overcome by grief. But we have to remind ourselves that again, nobody's taken before their time, that his timing is perfect. We don't have the answers. We don't know the whys. We don't know the reasons. Um, and, and, and it can be super challenging. I'm not trying to step on anybody who's dealing with grief or in that moment. But what I'm trying to do is speak truth to you to give you eyes to see and have a deeper, better understanding that God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't. So in the middle of tragedy, pray. In the middle of grief, pray. In the middle of sickness, pray. In the middle of trouble, pray. In the middle of suffering, pray. And I pray that your prayer, that's weird. I pray that you're praying for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. Those four things, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment. We have become sentimental and attached to this world and have placed what we see, feel, and experience here in life over the eternal over the spiritual realm. It needs to be the other way around. When we start looking at life through the lens of God and we start seeing eternity and what it is and for what it is and for who it's with, we will start to look at this life as this is a dress rehearsal. And it is of the utmost importance that the people who I love and care about, even strangers, like it is, it only adds emphasis on why we need to be focused, why we need to be alert, why we need to be awake, why we need to keep our nose in this thing so that we are constantly finding and seeking ways to help people put their faith in Jesus. So it's not goodbye, it's see you later. I just held up the word. This is this is what we've read in 227 days. This is what we have left of, left of the New Testament. 
I digress and I'm completely off topic, but I just looked at the book, right? This is, this is Matthew through James and this is first Peter through revelation. This is all that we have in 227 days. This is what we've read. This is what we've got left of the new Testament. I'm pretty excited about that. You guys understand that in 227 days, we've almost read the entire new Testament. It's super cool. And guess what we're going to do when we're done reading Revelation? We're going to start right back here at Matthew. And as we go through the Old Testament, which we have quite a bit of, we're going to start back at the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to go again, but we're going to do it with a different translation. So we went through, we'll go through the New Testament with the NCV and we'll probably go through it a second time with the New King James Version. Wow, that's so cool. Right? That's what we've read through in 227 days, New Testament. That's what we've got left. You think that could change your life? I know it can. I know it will. I know it has. It's been amazing. It's been super cool. So lastly, it talks about um, the healing, the prayer, praying. Um, Verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so God can heal you. When a believing person prays, great things happen. He uses the example of Elijah. Uh, He was a human being just like us. He prayed that it wouldn't rain, um, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the rain came down. Um, I want to go back. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Uh, We don't need a priest, right? You don't have to go to confessional. Um, That's not a part of following Jesus, but it is of the utmost importance, man. I think it's so important to share the things that you're going through. Um, I, I often say that when you're real, you heal. When you are real, you heal. I go to our men's group. We have a men's group. Um, all men, if you're a man and you are on this live, you are invited to be a part of our men's group. It is all online. I have brothers from around the world who are in this group. It's a Slack channel where we talk, we communicate, we message each other, we pray for each other. And then it's a once a week Zoom call at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time where we uh, get together and, and we go over scripture, we go over uh, the, the book of the month, whatever we're doing, but we hang out. But when we go there, a lot of brothers are confessing their sins to one another, Right? They're, they're confessing their sins. Um, if you had a friend who was joined and he was removed, then uh, I wonder if he, I have no idea why. Um, sometimes there's a, the bot goes through and cleans people out if they're spam emails or if they're not active um, or if they, uh, if they're there soliciting things, we've had people come in and they're just like, Hey guys, I, we got this brand new thing. And it's like, you're out of here. You're not joining the the thing to solicit. We're there for, we're there for business. I don't play around with that kind of stuff. So, um, I would have them do it again, but we get there and people are praying for each other. There's so much truth. There's honesty, you know, Hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Hey, I, I fell into sin. And I understand and know that these men are receiving absolute healing because of their vulnerability, their transparency. And I see men rising back up in the church. I feel like we've had a, an absence of the church, but I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the men have re-entered the church. They are coming back and they are coming back with strength. They're coming back with boldness. They're coming back with authenticity and they are here to stand on the head of the enemy. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, the last thing that it says here, um, My brothers and sisters, if one of you wanders away from the truth and someone helps that person come back, remember this. Anyone who brings a sinner back from the wrong way will save that sinner's soul from death and will cause many sins to be forgiven. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity in just a moment. Maybe you're backslid. Maybe you're away from God. Maybe you've walked away. Somehow you've stumbled upon this live. You're here in this place. But I want to give you the opportunity to return back. To return back. To give your life. Uh, back to God. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I'll answer this question again. People keep asking about my wife starting a a women's group. Um, She does not have the time, the energy, or the capacity. What many of you guys don't know is she does have a full-time job, and uh, she also runs our ministry behind the scenes. So um, 
she does not have the time or the capacity. It's not easy to to do. And so maybe in the future, but we're looking, we would love for a woman to step up and create one on their own um, because it is very time consuming and ministry is not as easy as a lot of people think. It is very time consuming. It's very laborious and um, it's not as sexy as you see. When you guys see the guy up on stage for an hour, it's so much more than that. And so, um, yeah, unfortunately, that is not an option at the moment uh, because she is spread extremely thin right now. So um, one day, hopefully, maybe somebody else can start it. Maybe maybe uh, another woman can start it. And the thing is, I see like for me, there's so many women's I see a lot of women's groups out there. There's a lot of groups. There's Proverbs 31 ministries and they've got all of these things for women. And for me, my heart posture was like, there's there's not a lot of stuff for dudes. There's not a lot of stuff for guys. Uh, I go to these church events and 90% are women. I go to these, these outreach events and it's mostly women. Like women have held the church down for the longest time. Moms and sisters and grandmas and aunts, they've stood in the gap and they've interceded. And that's what God put on my heart as I'm going to these places and I'm preaching. I'm just like, where are the men at? Where, where are the men? Where are the leaders of these homes? And that's why there was this sense of urgency like, hey, I, 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 I need to put together something for men. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I was at. Uh, There's a lot of resources I feel like for women and there's, uh, I mean, there's resources for men, but that's what, there was a sense of urgency for men because I think that a lot of the issues, a lot of the women are hurt by men. Bad relationships, not being led, compromising on the values and the beliefs. I think that the lack of leadership is what has harmed and scarred so many of the women in the church. They, they, you know, I think that that's where a lot of the hurt stems from and comes from is men walking out, men cheating and stepping away. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen on both sides, but I think that if we can start to heal uh, the, the, the way that God has intended things to be, if we can start to lift men up and empower them and get them back to the position that God called them to be, we can start fixing the family. We can start fixing the homes. We can start getting things back in order. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love it. I love it. I love it. And ladies, I would love for you guys to uh, to start something up. I mean, you know, if, if one of you want to take the lead um, and, and do something, you know, we can make something happen. We can definitely make something happen. So let's talk about um, chapter 29 of Genesis, right? Chapter 29 of, uh, of Genesis. Jacob takes off on his journey, right? Jacob takes off on his journey, and um, let me get a drink of this coffee real quick. He cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. Him and his mom were up to some schmarmy stuff. They put they put the wool on it. They put a coat on him. He goes in there, feeds his dad. He gets his brother's um, blessing. So uh, Isaac sends him off. He says, hey, go stay with your uncle, um, Rebecca's brother. So he takes off. As he gets there... He sees um, all of these sheep herder. They're in there. Uh, they're about to water their sheep at a well. And what they see is on top of the well, there's a cover. There's a rock. And so they push it off and they feed, the, you know, they, they let their sheep drink from it. Um, they, they water their sheep. And so he's there. He's chopping it up with them. He's like, hey, do you guys know my uncle? He's like, yeah, he's doing well. In fact, here comes his daughter, Rachel, with all of uh, his sheep. And he sees her and he's just like, oh, wow, immediately smitten. And so it's almost like he's showing off. He goes over there and he pushes the top off the well and waters the sheep and then gives her a kiss. He's like, hey, you know, I'm family, whatever. So she runs back and she goes and tells her dad. She's like, you know, hey, Jacob's here, yada, 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 boom. Dad comes running down. Long story short, you know, he's like, he, they, they get caught up. They're talking, hanging out. And he's like, you must be my nephew. <clears throat> And so then Laban's like, hey, you know, I want you to work for me. I, I, what, what, do you want, what do you want me to pay you? You're a great worker. You're handy. We love having you here. What, what would be your wages? And he said, look, let me, uh, I'll work for you for seven years if you let me marry your daughter, Rachel. And he's like, let's, that sounds like a plan. I'm here for it. Let's go. And so um, he does just that. He works for him for seven years. And after the seven years is up, he comes to him and he's like, okay, it's time to pay up. Let's, uh, let's get married. Let's do this. And so they throw a big extravagant wedding. They have all of this stuff. What does it say? They had, um, 
uh, okay, so they, they, oh, they made a feast. They made a feast and they, they had a party. And then at night they send Leah, the older sister into the tent and Jacob sleeps with her. And according to customs back then, that was enough to be a binding, um, relationship. So he was just like, he woke up the next morning. And he's like, what did you do? You he's like, you tricked me. You, 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 you know, you deceived me. And then it reminded me, what was Jacob doing, man? Jacob was a little deceiver. What did he do in the couple chapters before? He went in there and he deceived his dad and got his brother's birthright. So what comes around goes around. I don't want to say karma. We just talked about this yesterday, but the Lord. So I'm taking one second real quick. I'm taking one second because it keeps pausing saying poor connection, but my connection should be awesome. There we go. Okay. I think we're back. I don't think that we lost anybody. Are we good? Maybe. Yeah, it keeps freezing on me too. Hmm. I wonder why. It keeps cutting out on me too. You know why? It's because we're going to do a digital altar call. People are going to get saved. Interesting. Interesting. It was freezing. It was pausing. Same for me. Six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to be brief and then we're going to do Right there, it just paused on me. Long story short, he got tricked. He married the wrong daughter. Because the custom was you got to marry the older before the younger. He had seven years to find this out, but he didn't, he didn't hear none of this until after the deal. The dad says, hey, I'll let you marry Rachel next week if you give me another seven years. And so he did. He married him in the one week. This dude got four wives because listen, basically this is what happened. He married Leah and got her maid, right? Who will eventually have some of his kids. He got Rachel and her. This man went from zero wives to basically four in the span of a week, right? Which is ridiculous. That's crazy. So um, basically he works another seven years. He, you know, now he's got Rachel and the two, he's got all these wives, right? He's got all these wives. And then, uh, listen, this is it. You guys are reading this on your own. Um, Leah starts bearing children. She has four kids. There's some jealousy that goes on. We're going to pick this part up tomorrow when we get into chapter 30. This is what I want to do. There is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. I'm not going to have it today. I'm not gonna you guys read Genesis chapter 29 on your own. That was That's kind of the gist of things. We'll do a recap. Right now, look. If you don't know Jesus and you're on this live, I want you to receive him today. I don't want you to go another day without knowing Jesus. Today, we are doing a digital altar call. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're away from God. Maybe you don't know Jesus. I don't want you to go another moment. There is resistance from the enemy in the spiritual realm because some receive the free gift of salvation. Somebody is going to receive the free gift of salvation by putting their faith in Jesus today today. And if that's you, if you're like, Andrew, I want to receive Jesus. I don't want to go another day, not knowing where I will go, where I will spend eternity. I want you in the comment section right now to put, I want to be saved. That's what I want. I want to be, listen, whether you're on the live or the replay, last time we did this, there were people on the replay in the comments days later saying, I want to be saved. If that's you, look, if, if that's you, Joseph, let, if that's you say, I want to be saved, put that in the chat. If this is only for one, that's why there's resistance this morning. That's right there. Right there is exactly right there. So there's still lag. There's still a disconnect. You guys do not leave. People are being saved right now. There's a reason why there is a disconnect. There's a reason why this didn't want to go down. Because the enemy is losing souls. There has been resistance all week. There has been all kinds of attacks. But what we are doing here is greater than us. It's greater than us. There are people... Who there are people who want to come back to Christ. They've been backslid. They haven't walked with him. They've turned their back on him. They've ignored him. But just like the prodigal son, God wants you to come home today. He wants you to come home. He wants you to humble yourself, repent of your sins and return to the flock, return to the family. Amen. We're not going to allow the enemy to win. If that's you, and you've, if you haven't put it yet, put I want to be saved and I'm going to lead you guys in prayer.
And I want you to come back here tomorrow when we have better reception. We have greater reception and we're going to be able to, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit deeper. We're going to start a brand new chapter, a brand new chapter, right? I've seen 20. I've seen, I've seen 20. You want to understand why there's dis- there's distraction. You want to understand why we've experienced bots. Why you want to understand why there's been distraction. And I got up late. There's been all of this through the chap, the whole five chapters of James. There's been nothing. There's been nothing but distraction. But understand that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Not one. They'll form, but they will not prosper. Jesus will receive no poor connection. There is no poor connection. This is the devil throwing a temper tantrum, trying to stop God's work. I want you to say this with me. I want you to say, God, I repent of my sins. I am in need of a savior. Right now, I invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life and the savior of my soul. I invite the Holy Spirit to dwell in me all the days of my life. God, take me by the hand and lead me, guide me, and never depart from me. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I put my faith, my hope, and my trust in him. I believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. And I believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. I received the free gift of salvation by putting my faith in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All of a sudden, right? All of a sudden there's these connection issues. We had no issues. We've had disruption. We've had late starts. That's on me. We've had uh, bots coming in, right? Now we've got poor connection. Here we are trying to save, like individuals trying to come home. They're trying to be fed. Oh, man. No, glory to God. This is what we're going to do is we're going to pray. We're going to get out of here. I can't keep doing this. Uh, But if that's you, if you said that prayer and you you received the free gift of salvation, I want you to go to my website. There's some free things that we have on royalcitychurch.org. You drop down the menu. It says, if you just received salvation, these are for you. And I want you guys to come back here, whether you're on the live, whether you're on the replay, come back tomorrow and be more connected than this thing that keeps pausing in the middle of everything that I'm saying. So let's... um, Let's pray. Let's pray and let's uh, let's have a great rest of our day, a great rest of our, our week. Glory to God. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you in your mercy. We pray that your word would be written on the tablet of our heart. God, we stand on your truth. We know that no weapon formed against us will prosper, that the gates of hell will not prevail. Help us to know who we are, the authority and the boldness the fight that we have inside of us. Help us to be warriors in this world, sharing the light and the love and the truth of Jesus, bringing sinners to a place of repentance, leading them with gentleness to where they know Jesus, that the Holy Spirit can grab a hold of them and change them and transform them. God, we need you and we cannot do this without you. We are so honored that you would meet us in this place, that you would draw near to us, that you would speak to us, you would sit with us. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We love you guys, we honor you, and uh, man, I I just appreciate you guys for rocking with me, even through the technical difficulties. Um, God received glory this morning. Mm, it's so good. So, so good. Um, I love you guys. I honor you. I'd say at least 20 people gave their life to Jesus. I'm not sure. I couldn't see with the lag and everything. But look, you guys have an amazing day and I will see you guys back here tomorrow with a far greater connection. Bring your friends and your family members. We're starting First Peter, brand new book. It's going to be amazing. See you guys then.